I'm David Berlin with Blockchain Journal. I'm coming to you from Davos, Switzerland, where World Economic Forum is currently taking place. And standing with me right now is Stefan Ferfat. Stefan is the head of growth for Protocol Labs. Protocol Labs is the research arm that's behind Filecoin, which is one of the leading places that you would store information and data on blockchain. And you just finished giving a presentation on storage, on blockchain, in the enterprise. Stefan, thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to have you. So, the reason that we're roaming around World Economic Forum here is to find out about how blockchain is being embraced by enterprises. Uh, but before we start with that, could you please tell me what exactly it is that Filecoin does? Yeah, well, good question. So Filecoin is the largest decentralized storage network out there. Our goal is to store humanity's most important information. So what we've seen is that um, there's a need for a new way of storing data that is uh, allowing customers to trace, verify, and protect their own assets. So essentially what we're doing is we're putting the control back in the user's hands by building out this fully decentralized blockchain-enabled uh, storage network that allows any enterprise or end consumer to store data on this network that is 95% cheaper than what you would pay for at Amazon, Google, and Microsoft at this point, um, is fully uh, mutable, meaning no single entity has full control over the network because it's decentralized, which one of the benefits, obviously, of blockchain, um, so that one, uh, customers can store the data in a cheaper and more cost-efficient way, but also the data is Immutable, which means that there's data won't be able to, you can't change the data, and if you would change it, it would be immediately identified. And then three, it's verifiable, meaning the data gets verified on a daily basis um, to ensure that your data is still intact and is still ex exactly the same as you originally stored it. So these uh, characteristics of Falcon make it very um, interesting for companies like you know UC Berkeley to store their data assets on Falcon because it's a great alternative to public cloud or on-premise solutions that may cost a lot more, um, or um, you know, customers are looking at storing data in certain geographical locations where there is no Amazon or there is no Google. That's where you know, Filecoin can offer a solution. Great, so when enterprises used to store all of their data on-premises with their own databases, Oracle databases, SQL databases, Amazon came along and introduced the idea of cloud storage. Storage. It took a long time for them to get used to that idea, but now cloud storage is a big thing. You're talking about maybe the next revolution in storage, but you also talked about immutability, and I think that when you look back at how enterprises use something like a database, they actually do appreciate the idea that they can go in and edit a record. So, when you talk about the immutability of the data that's stored on a blockchain, which is one of the big characteristics of anything on blockchain, to what use cases is that immutability suited? Because once it's on the chain, you really can't change it, and that's something that enterprises actually do a lot of. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, uh, one, we are a platform, right? So, as a platform, our goal is to create the tooling and the capabilities so that customers and um, uh, software providers can build a middle layer between the database, the databases that are out there today and the distributed blockchain that we provide. And so the immutability is crucial definitely when you're looking at archives, right? So that's why we're seeing our initial use cases are typically uh, customers that are moving data from tape or public cloud or on-premises and they have these long-term uh, data preservation requirements, like three years to 10 years even, where data, like every single bit matters and so for them, uh, the immutability and the verifiability is super crucial. Um, second, like the database like you were describing is sort of like the next phase, right? Is where, you know, there's new technologies being built right now, new app dApps, uh, distributed applications that are building equivalent of like what we know as, as, as a distributed database today, but then on top of Filecoin. So um, we're doing it in a staged approach. Our first step is go after the archives and second is then uh, improving our retrievability to in and increase the performance so we can deliver better performance and faster performance to lower latency applications. Today we're not a perfect fit yet for databases, we're a fit for archives and backups, and then over time as we improve our uh, performance and our retrievability, we'll move up the stack and get closer to like more like the real-time applications over time. 
I was inside the presentation and I was watching the gentleman before you, Jonathan Doten from Starling Labs, and he was talking about the preservation of war crime data. So that seems like one of those things that's really important because that data will have a role in the ongoing uh, prosecution of right. war criminals and things like that. So that, is that a really good example of where oh, that? Totally. It's a, uh, that's an amazing example because they capture the data at uh, the camera, right? At the, at the actual endpoints where data is being captured and they track the hash and the, uh, the footprint essentially of that video footage all the way from the edge all the way to the back end storage. So this is a perfect example of a fully integrated end to end workflow where they use the, the hashing technology to identify the uh, integrity and actually like the, the actual truth, the fact that there was someone on site, identified there was a war crime, uh, it's all logged and it's traceable all the way back to the, the back end storage uh, of Falcon. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Uh, in your presentation, which I s sat through, which is about uh, storage on blockchain in the enterprise, you talked about the problems that enterprises have with egress costs. So let's first talk about what an egress cost is and why that's problematic for enterprises. Yeah, yeah, so we've talked to a bunch of uh, customers. So one, we did research with IDC, right? We reached out to more than 300 enterprises and asked them, hey, do you know, do you know about these new decentralized storage technologies? And majority of the enterprise actually have heard of it, which is great. When we asked them what their major bottlenecks were today, uh, with existing cloud providers. Uh, egress, the 41% of the enterprises claim that egress costs were so expensive. That's the cost of getting off the platform. Exactly. And, and so what it actually is, it's actually the cost of, it's cheap of, it's cheap to move data into the cloud, right? Um, but it's extremely expensive to take it out. It can take, it can cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars to take out a couple of petabytes out of the cloud. It's almost in certain, in certain scenarios, it's almost as much as setting up a completely new environment. But unfortunately, yeah, you need your data. Those, those are your, your, your uh, most impressive, imp important assets. And so what we're doing with Falcoin is, because it's an open marketplace, there are no fixed egress costs. So it's really up to the ecosystem, to the community, to decide what those, um, what those prices are. And How does that work? Like you know, when I'm working with a cloud storage, let's say Amazon's S3, or even on-prem storage from some company that provides that, uh, Veritas, a company that I believe that you're used to, used to work with, um, uh, how, did, how is it that somebody else is setting the pricing for the cost of putting data on chain or taking it off? Yeah, it's a supply and demand, right? Um, so one storage provider, so we have more than 4,000 systems in our ecosystem. And when you look at our network. These are all the nodes that are on the chain running the chain. These are all the nodes, exactly. So, and those are like hundreds or you know close to a thousand entities, right? Um, companies that are actually running these nodes, and some of them are more focused on wholesale, very like cost efficient storage capacity. Others are more like white gloves, provide a white glove service. They will come into an enterprise customer. They will provide storage services. They will. They will capture the data, encrypt the data, store it on the network, they will create connectors. My point in this is that, depending on what you're looking for, you will be able to shop, and you are able to shop around today, and talk to different storage providers and negotiate your own contract based on whatever your needs are. Sometimes it is you need a certain, let's say, a storage provider in, in Belgium or you know, in San Diego, close to where the research is being done, because you need fast performance, or you need the data to be stored within certain uh, country boundaries because of you know a GDPR or certain regulation requirements. So that's all feasible, and so in our network right now, there's an oversupply, right? So there's meaning there's 15 exabyte of capacity sitting out there, and there's 500 petabytes of data actively stored today, which is amazing. So every day we uh, add around four petabytes of, of data onto the network, and because there's an oversupply, there's also um, a very it's it's also very cost efficient because a lot of storage providers are looking for clients and so right now we're in this position where you know the cost of storing data on Falcon is 95% cheaper than an Amazon or Google Microsoft. But that cost could change right as the right. demand for the uh, storage capacity on the network goes up and there's less of it around for anybody else who's coming on is that where the price might change? Yeah absolutely so we do expect that the uh, the market will automatically balance itself out, meaning the price will balance itself out. We still think that's going to take a couple of years just because of the network still growing on a daily basis, plus the use cases are growing as well. So this is not a, um, it's very hard. You can't just look at cost by itself uh, because there's huge benefits of uh, using a decentralized network, as you know. Today we store, for example, more than 120 million NFTs 
from OpenSea and so on. And so it's our belief that every data, digital footprint that you create, all data sets that you create, should be stored as an NFT. And so that is not something that's feasible, that you, it's not something that cloud providers can offer today. And so there's a lot of new functionality, like data DAOs that are being built, that um, is going to be only available on a decentralized stack. And so my point with this is that over time, as the pricing will stabilize, also more functionality will become available in our network that is differentiating, that customers are willing to pay for, customers are looking for, that will not be available in what we know as today, the public cloud providers. Yeah, it's early days and you're yeah. building a platform here and exactly. the platform's just going to have more capabilities for enterprises to tap into. Uh, you were, we were talking about the egress cost, the cost of getting off, but what you didn't talk about in your presentation are the ingress costs. And, and I think one of the interesting things about ingress on anything blockchain is, whereas with something like Amazon or a traditional storage provider, there's a, a contract you have to sign or there's a, you have to drop a credit card ahead of time and they bill you on a monthly basis. Blockchain is more of a coin-operated scenario. Right. You don't pay until you put the very first item on the chain and you only pay for that little bit. So talk a little bit about the enterprise reception yeah. to that sort of business model and the ingress costs. Yeah, 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 I think it's a great question. So how data is moving into the network, as you said, we're moving to a different model, right? Because we're using a wallet, uh, we're pay, paying in tokens. The way, the, the, the place we're at today is where storage providers that are typically not only providing the capacity, the storage, are also the ones that are hunt, that are also collaborating with the end customer and are closing or are helping data to be onboarded. So they're the ones that are actually going out to the end customer, are encrypting the data, transferring it, like either physically uh, or over the wire, meaning like offline or online. And so they are the ones right now that are sort of obfuscating, right, this whole notion of tokens. Like, you know, so they are making, they're closing an agreement with the end customer in fiat at this point. Um, and they're using middleware to automate some of that. It's sort of like the old value added reseller model, right? Yes. Where yes. somebody builds a solution on top of your platform, they sell that solution to the end is one of the barriers to adoption for enterprise is just the idea of having to hold the crypt cryptocurrency that's necessary to pay the fees. That makes it possible for them to pay in fiat currency, right? right. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So today we see our storage providers as a channel, exactly. And they're like helping those end customers to move on chain without telling them or like sharing, no, of course they will tell them, but without sharing them all the complexity. I think over time in the next couple of years, our goal is to get enterprise customers also more you know, comfortable with like having tokens on their balance sheets and so on. Obviously that's a longer road that we're taking and that's why we're collaborating with Ernst & Young, uh, AMD and Seagate, and we have a ton of other partnerships in, in the works to help build the processes that these enterprises, you know, will have to go through to like adopt some of these newer technologies. And so today what you're seeing is sort of a similar model as 16 years ago, right, where the cloud providers came out with S3 and, and other cloud s uh, services is sort of like these gateways that are obfuscating, right? Back in the day it was, you know, you, there were file to S3 or file to object inter gateways that were sort of simplifying, right, the uh, com complexity and, and how data was moved into the cloud in the same way this is happening today. So we're building these on-ramps or these gateways that sort of simplify for enterprise customers how data is being moved into this network. So we're seeing S3 gateways today that are being built on top of Filecoin so that customers can just point their applications instead of to like an Amazon to, um, to Filecoin but through these gateways. And then over time what we'll see is more of the applications in the enterprise space will natively talk to Filecoin over time. Now this will take a couple of years, and that's also why in Protocol Labs, we hugely invest in startups. So we have more than 500 companies today that are funded and are building on top of Filecoin, and it ranges from consumer products that are competing against Spotify. So we see Spotify alternatives, Zoom alternatives, um, you know, um, all sorts of like platforms that sort of exist today in Web3 but are now being built on top of Web3 uh, networks and in infrastructure. And Falcon is one of the key components there because every application needs to store data, right? And that's really why we are investing so heavily in this Web3 movement and at the same time build the bridges, the connectors with the Web3 
um, in existing Web2 uh, Web2 enterprises. Sorry. Sometimes I call that Web2.5. Web2.5. It's probably better to say Web2.5. Yes, because um, you know it is a lot of Web2, but it's really like trying to make it you know transparent for enterprise customers to like take advantage of these new technologies. And then what will happen is eventually some of these Web3 startups, right, will eventually overtake some of these existing Web2 applications. And we'll see like, you know, some unicorns come out of this. And yeah, we're very excited. It's a very interesting world. Okay, so now uh, you guys have taken over this really beautiful old church uh, here on the main promenade going down to uh, the uh, Congress Center. You're steps away from the Congress Center the, where the World Economic Forum is taking place. Uh, so you're probably getting a lot of traffic coming out of the Congress Center. How's your World Economic Forum been? Uh, for me, you know, it's my first year. I mean, same by the way. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'm I'm impressed. I'm actually overwhelmed. It's amazing. Definitely here in the space that we have, the, uh, the people that are coming through. Like we had a whole delegation of uh, U.S. Congress uh, yesterday. We had um, the founder of World Wide Web was uh, did a talk with our founder of. Uh, oh, is Tim Berners Lee here? He was here yesterday. Uh, and so he's very, you know, um, he did a talk with our, with Juan, our CEO, who started IPFS and Filecoin. And it was great to see those two leaders, right? Uh, the one that built World Wide Web and Juan, who is, you know, because we're building a decentralized, a new infrastructure for decentralized web, so the new web, basically. So it was great to see those two leaders together and see the old and the new come together, which is great. Yeah, and Tim Berners-Lee is a big fan of decentralization. He built out this new thing called the Solid Project, which is all about decentralization. Hey, so, Stefan Verfacht, uh, thank you very much for joining us here on Blockchain Journal in Davos, Switzerland. Awesome. Thank you for the interview. Thanks for coming.